On the 3rd of November 1943, the B-24Hs of the 448th Bomb Group had completed their final training at Sioux City in Iowa and were headed to Harrington Field in Kansas. The cruiser completed six weeks of intensive training and were finally considered battle ready. The crews had to be one hour into their flight to be open their sealed letters and find out where they were heading to. The B-24Hs of the 448th found out that they were headed to the 8th Air Force in England and the Seething Airfield. There were two main routes that the American units could take, the Northern Route and the Southern Route. The Northern Route would take the units through Newfoundland and then to Presswick in Scotland. The Southern Route would take the units a lot longer, taking them from Trinidad to Brazil. Then they would cross the Atlantic to Dakar in North Africa. The final leg was then flown due north towards Cornwall, avoiding Spanish and French air spaces for obvious reasons. The northern route was only used in the summer, so the 448th had to take the longer, more strenuous southern route, which was incredibly exhausting for the new inexperienced pilots. On their way to Seething, the 448th lost two units, with one of them crashing into the Alps. They lost a third unit, which crashed in a fiery ball of flames at their refueling base in Cornwall. The first of the B-24s touched down in Seething in the early days of 1943, and the young Americans found it to be one pub, one small store, a church, and maybe six houses. Not very large, but very picturesque. Numerous farms were scattered around the field. They were typically English, right out of the history books. Many of the buildings still used thatched roofs and stone walls. I was here as a child during the war, I was nine years old when the 448s actually arrived up the airfield. It was only just about a mile and a quarter away from my home. And you, you must remember that we'd been at war since 1939. Everywhere was drab and, and you know, we were on rations. My dad was away in the RAF and um, suddenly they were building an airfield. And then um, we heard their Americans were coming. And uh, the impact that had, I mean, there would be, I suppose, were just over 300, 350 people living in Seething at that time. And suddenly to have 3,000 young Americans just down the road, you can imagine the impact it had here. And uh, the first thing I noticed, uh, you know, we, that impacted on us was um, the aircraft. When they arrived in November 1943, you can't believe how huge they were and the sound they made and at night time sound travels so you would lay awake and the first thing we heard was the, the, the noise the putt putt engines would start up on the airfield and then start up the four Pratt and Whitney um, engines and uh, then there would be this terrible noise you know as they were taking off um, to go off to war and then then um, the only way they had to get around the villages were on bicycles and they would always be, remember all the signposts had been taken down so that it was to confuse the enemy but confused everybody else so they would come and stop you and ask you, you know, um, can you tell us where the nearest pub is and um, sometimes would ask you if you've got a big sister at home. The Seething Airfield had been specifically constructed for the USAF's use and the 12 different living and mess halls were to the south end of the field towards the village of Fuit St Mary. Like most of the airfields in Norfolk, Seething suffered severe drainage problems and throughout the winter of 1943 the airmen had a long battle with mud. Within three weeks of their arrival at Seething, the crews and their aircraft were ready to launch. They were not given a gentle introduction to the war because on the 22nd of December 1943, the 448th were sent to bomb a railway complex in Osnabrück. This particular area was well known to be heavily defended, but on the 22nd the flak was said to have been not a problem. But the number of enemy fighters that suddenly materialised were. They appeared in great abundance. At this point, all seemed unreal, and I guess I was doing things purely automatically and practically, as I had been taught, recalled one of the group's air gunners. The 
The weather during most of January 1944 was not conducive to operational flying, but the 8th Air Force had a new commander, General Jimmy Doolittle, and he was itching to mount a massive attack on the Germans' aircraft industry. His philosophy was that the air war should be won at all costs. On February the 20th, 1944, the big week commenced, and it was a six-day bombing raid that the 448th took part in over Magdeburg, Gotha, and Firth. This major offensive was a traumatic time for all the crews involved, especially the young pilots of the 448th, who came off relatively unscathed with only losing one aircraft. To go to the dreaded Gotha with their Messerschmitt 10 factories and only lose one aircraft was no mean feat. But to then be told you're going to Firth near Nuremberg with its dreaded flat cannons was even more of a big deal. There was almost no let up in March, with the 8th flying nearly 12,000 missions, costing them 350 aircraft and 3,300 men. On the 6th, the 448th was sent to Berlin, one of the most heavily air armoured areas of Germany. This mission proved to be the costliest raid of the war so far, however the 448th managed to only survive with one aircraft missing. Just like on the 6th, the 448th were sent back to Berlin on the 22nd. They managed to survive this raid again, which was quite an incredible feat, and it shows the discipline of the 448th bomb group, with them only losing two aircraft in two missions to the most heavily guarded area of Germany. April proved to be an extremely disastrous month for the 448th. On the 1st, they were sent to Ludwigshaven. The weather conditions over northern Europe were atrocious, with heavy thick cloud up to over 21,000 feet. The 448th, along with two other groups, strayed away from the main formation, and this slight error was punished harshly by the Luftwaffe. During the first attack, the group's lead aircraft was shot down, and with it their commanding officer, Colonel James Thompson. Unfortunately, his parachute failed to open. Without a leader, the rest of the group were lucky to have survived with just a few casualties. April 22nd, 1944. Most people know it as that, but to some of the crews in the 2nd Division of the 8th Air Force, it was known as something else, the Night of the Intruders. They were briefed to go uh, fly on this mission that day, and then they were recalled because the weather was too bad over the target area. And uh, then they were recalled after lunch, and they didn't take off till about four o'clock. And uh, as they were coming back, uh, that was dark, and the German fighter planes got in, in among them. And my dad happened to be home on leave at that time. And there was all these guns firing all around everywhere. They were on the trace of bullets, and bullets were going off and we saw fires up the airfield and that made a big impact on us and uh, and uh, you know you, you know, for a child that's something that stays with you despite heavy flak on a bombing run over the marshalling yards at ham in germany the 448th only lost one aircraft over the target area but on the way home the crews noticed an unusual amount of fighter activity on the french coast as the aircraft neared Southwold, it was very dark, even though the sky was clear. The complicated exercise of landing many damaged and broken bombers on different airfields in a small area was difficult enough during the day, let alone the night. By 9.30pm the aircraft had started their landing patterns and it was at this exact point that the Luftwaffe struck. The enemy aircraft had followed the bombers all the way back from Germany and one of the young pilots of the 448th recalled the events. They were waiting like vultures for us to come in. We were being shot at like sitting ducks. It was like if all hell had broke loose. There were ships everywhere, some going down in flames it doesn't bear thinking about. One of the 448th was shot down and crashed into the sea. Another near Kessingland and even another near Whirlingham. The Vady Ray was on its final landing approach onto the runway when it was shot up by a Messerschmitt 110 and crashed in a ball of flames. Luckily, the captain, Alvin D. Skaggs, was able to move the plane off the runway before anyone was hurt and all the crew had survived. 
Later, two more aircraft collided at the end of the runway. Unfortunately, both those crews were killed. All three of the receiving runways were lit up with ammunition after being strafed by Messerschmitt 110s. The fires of the crash B-24s and other debris raged on until at least three in the morning the next day. The second division lost seven aircraft on their raid of the marshalling yards, and they lost another 14 back home. This proved to be one of the most catastrophic nights for all of the airfields in Norfolk, none more so than Seaving. Even though most of the American bases put on parties for the local children, the 448th went a step further. Major Newton McLaughlin, the Special Services Officer, the base's chaplain and the base's surgeon became very involved with the Jenny Lynn Crippled Children's Hospital. With permission from the base's commanding officer, Colonel Charles Westover, the men adopted the children. They shared their rations and collected money for presents at Christmas time, which were handed out at a big party on the base. One crew member said it was a splendid way to cement the relationship between the Yanks and the English. During the last months of the war, the 448th was involved in all of the major operations mounted by the 8th Air Force. On the 4th of April, the 448th was sent to Kiel. Previously, they had been treated fairly by the enemy forces, but this time it was different. The Luftwaffe had sufficient fuel sources for their relatively new jet-powered ME-262s. This newfound fuel source cost the 448 free aircraft, which was even more tragic than normal considering that it was so close to the end of the war. Three weeks later, the 448 went out on its 262nd mission, and their last. Over the course of the war, Seaving had lost 101 aircraft in action, which was a higher number than usual. This shows the immense sacrifice and contribution the 448th and its crews made to the mighty 8th Air Force's offensive and the war effort. And now 77 years on, the 448th and Seaving's history is still remembered, whether it's via plaques on the side of the road or amazing people who preserve its history. This video was made as part of my DOV Skills Award and is the last video of my DOV Skills Award. I do hope you've enjoyed this series. You can learn more about the DOV Skills Award by clicking the first link in the description below and you can see the entirety of my DOV Skills Award in a playlist called DOV Skills. That's the second link in the description below. If you like videos about Norfolk folklore or history, consider subscribing. Before this video ends, I would like to say thank you for watching. This has been one of the biggest videos I've ever done, roughly 12 weeks in the making. I've had so much fun organising it and making it, even if thinking of questions for interviews was really hard. Uh, thank you to Richard Nash, the chairman of Seaving Control Tower Museum, for organising access to the site, the plane ride and interviews. Thank you to Miss Everson for offering her time for an interview. Thank you to the Seaving Control Tower Museum for having such rich history. And thank you to my pilot, Carl, for giving up his time to take me up in a plane ride. Once again, I do hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, if you like history or Norfolk folklore, consider subscribing. Bye. March,